Good morning. We are starting chapter 14 today, uh, looking at acids and bases and looking at the, um, the K for acids and bases, especially the K for acids, called the acid dissociation constant. But it's based on the same stuff that you already know. So here's just some basic information about acids and bases. Taste sour versus taste bitter. Um, and then the Arrhenius theory is what we're most uh, used to, which is the uh, providing or production of hydrogen ions versus the providing or production of hydroxide ions, which is not really the complete story. Uh, it's a decent starting point. But if we add in, <clears throat> sorry, if we add into this the Bronsted Lowry theory models also, then we get a, a, a more broad spectrum of what could be classified as an acid and as a base. Then also that helps us develop uh, with the Bronsted Lowry theory. Um, as we look at acid, conjugate acids and conjugate bases as well, um, allows us to uh, establish the equilibrium constant for this as well. So that's kind of where this is headed. So adding to the, to the Arrhenius theory, the bronsted lowry theory basically says the same thing about the acid, right? Hydrogen ion is a bare proton, um, but the bronsted lowry theory now shows a, a bigger umbrella because of just saying that it produces hydroxide ions isn't all that makes a base. We could say anything that accepts a proton then could be classified as a bronsted lowry base. We'll see examples of that as we are going through this. Sorry, I didn't turn on the pad. Identify each bronsted lowry acid and base. So to begin with, what we would say is we'll pick on the one that's easy. HCl, we know that is hydrochloric acid, must be our acid. All right. Now, what constitutes being an acid? The fact that it's going to donate a hydrogen ion and become just a chloride ion all by itself on the other side. Meanwhile, water, we don't think of water as being an acid or a base. In a few minutes, we're going to call it amphoteric, which means that water has the ability to be both acidic and basic, has both the ability to... Um, provide a hydrogen ion if it's needed, but it also has the ability to an accept to accept the hydrogen ion, to accept the proton. And you can see that's what happened if you go from the reactant side to the product side is H2O somehow attached a hydrogen ion to its chin and became H3O with a plus one charge. So therefore, in the bronsted lowry theory, it is acting as a base. If you'd like to see it in the Arrhenius theory, of course, you can always write your waters as HOH, and now you can see the amphoteric nature has both the ability to uh, provide a hydrogen ion, but also has the ability to provide a hydroxide ion, or in bronsted lowry we could say it could provide the hydrogen or it can accept the hydrogen, and therefore it's still the same thing. All right, now we need to be able to look at these reactions going in both directions. It has to be both forward and reverse reactions. So going in the reverse direction are H3O, commonly called hydronium ion, has the, uh, is losing the hydrogen ion to become water, H2O. So therefore, we would say that this is acting as an acid. So we give it a name to make it different from the acid on the reactant side. We call it the conjugate acid. Okay, we know conjugate is a word from our English classes that has to do with or maybe from our foreign language classes, has to do with uh, changing what a verb is doing, right? I think that's what it is. Anyway, it's kind of like the piece that goes with the other side puzzle. You can uh, look it up to see how that word applies, but you get the idea that this conjugate acid is related to this base. And then the chloride ion, if you go the reverse direction, becomes HCl, which means that it accepted the hydrogen ion, that makes it the conjugate base. All right, so by bronsted lowry theory, those are our answers for that. And then now it's time for us to write the equilibrium constant for this reaction. So we know that the K expression takes products over the reactants raised to the power of their coefficients. Everybody's got a coefficient of one, but there's one thing that we need to change on this. So even though I'm gonna write it all down, I am going to alter it a little bit, so you might decide to wait for a moment. There's our react, I'm sorry, there's our products put on the, in the numerator. Then for our reactants, we've got HCl and we've got water. But the problem is 
Well, we were told back in the day is that all of these have to be aqueous and water is not aqueous. Water is a pure liquid. So therefore, water can't be measured in a concentration unit. So we have to kick it out of the K expression. And which, you know, that makes sense because we did that before. We'll kick it out of the K expression. And now we have an equilibrium constant that is specific for the dissociation of an acid. So we're going to call this K the acid dissociation constant rather than just calling it the equilibrium constant. Same thing, just a different name because it's applying specifically to what happens with an acid in solution. Okay, so I just kind of already did that, right? I already had that on that previous slide. And how we would write that, originally I wrote it as H3O plus uh, chloride divided by HCl. Um, also, we should recognize that, you know, had this reaction, this is very common, that we would actually write HCl aqueous, kind of as a shorthand notation, really, H plus and Cl negative, that these really are the same thing. To say H plus, where is a hydrogen ion in solution, right? When you have a, when you put hydro, hydrogen chloride down into a beaker of water, where is the hydrogen ion? Well, the water molecules are going to take on the hydrogen ion and form this hydronium with a plus charge. So whether you write it as H3O plus or H plus, that's up to you. Be prepared that you're going to see both. Okay. Um, write the simple dissociation, the Ka for each of these. So in order for us to do, oh, and also I didn't call it the Ka, did I? So yeah, I did here, but I didn't on the slide where we wrote it um, on this one. Let's just add an A to that so that we know that that's a special kind of equilibrium constant. It's dealing with acids and it's called the Ka, the acid, dis acid dissociation constant. And why we need to make sure we know that name is because when we're doing a Ka versus a Kb, that we know that in the numerator, there's going to be a hydrogen ion. When we do a Kb, we're going to see a hydroxide ion there. And so therefore, it's important for us to recognize the difference so that we can kind of kind of cheat ahead, really. And some of these problems, it allows us to know where we expect this to go. What do I mean by that? Let's use that right here in this example. Um, as you look at these problems, because they're telling us that, the, that we're going to write a Ka for each one of them, that means that we need to have something that shows us the uh, hydrogen ion in the numerator. So you're going to take each of your substances, you're just going to dissociate it, dissociate it in a way that it gives you a hydrogen ion. We'll break this one up as hydrogen ion and the acetate ion. Those hydrogens there are part of this carbon backbone that's there. And so acetate stays together as a polyatomic ion. So H plus acetate and then the acetic acid. Okay. Now, with some of our acids, I guess I should have talked about this with the hydrogen chloride. This is a hundred percenter. This acid is, when we write this out here for a Ka expression, um, this doesn't really have any meaning because the HCl at the bottom here is virtually zero, but it can't be zero or else this becomes undefined. So we could say that the Ka for a strong acid is infinitely large or is at least just very large. Maybe that's a better way to say it because this reaction doesn't really need, in fact, I didn't even draw double arrows when I put it down here. I put just a single arrow going forward because this is gonna 100% dissociate, all right? There's gonna be virtually no HCl left over once we have put it in solution. Acetic acid, though, that's not true. There is going to be some hydrogen acetate in the solution, too, because this reaction reaches an equilibrium. All right, so this is considered a weak acid. The ammonium ion, well, the ammonium ion, you're thinking ammonia. That's actually something that we associate with being a base. So what is the ammonium ion is actually the conjugate acid to the weak base ammonia. All right, so be prepared to see that a whole bunch during this chapter. But for right now, we're just doing what we're told. What we're told is to take this and write a Ka for it, which means that I want to remove a hydrogen ion from it, just like that. And then I'll make it a double arrow so that we're at some kind of equilibrium. 
where that equilibrium exists, let's worry about that later. Today's not about that. Today is just about us being able to write this out. And there's our Ka. And so if that's true for the ammonium ion that we kind of sort of know, what about this anilium ion, right? Anilinium, anilinium ion. How do we decide how to break that up? Well, I'm going to do the same thing. I got to choose a hydrogen to break off of this. Turns out that it's going to be one of the hydrogens here off of the, um, the nitrogen group. This is going to be an, like an amine group, I think. Um, but it doesn't matter. What matters is, is when you break it off, I don't know. It doesn't even matter what order I put them in. What matters is, is when I take off a hydrogen, bring it down to a two, there's no charge here. It's neutral because that plus one charge went away with the hydrogen ion that we pulled off of there. Okay. So the anilinium ion is really a conjugate acid to the base that we're going to see here coming up in some sections in the future. Ka equals, once again, doesn't matter what order we put them in, but it is customary to list the hydrogen first, just because, no other reason. It's not even that important. Okay, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, and then you guys know what to do with Ka's. You know that this means there's going to be values that go in for concentrations. We know from Le Chatelier's principle that we can adjust this. Uh, we got lots of things that we can do, but this is going to be the important part is measuring that because in the future sections, we can say that measuring of that is how we discover pH, but that's not for today. Okay. Um, acid strength, I kind of already alluded to this a little bit by talking about the hydrogen, about the hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, and so therefore there's really not an equilibrium that's established. It's 100% producing ions. But we're going to see lots of acids in this chapter that are weaker acids, which means that there's going to be an equilibrium that exists somewhere in the middle. And so therefore... We established this with the bronsted lowry theory that we could write out this dissociation equation here and then that you understand the meaning of what it is that you're seeing. Now, I'll be speaking of this a lot during the chapter, but let's get this started right now. You need to recognize the strength of these two relative to each other. You need to recognize that if HA is a strong acid, that you're going to have a lot of the ions in solution. I mean, 100% of the ions in solution. And therefore, that makes this a very weak conjugate base. If this is a strong acid, this is a very weak, strong, strong, I can't say it, very weak conjugate base. If this is a weak acid, that means then that this conjugate base now has some strength, right? So the two things are kind of working against each other, we understand why they're working against each other. I mean, they're not enemies, but we recognize that they're working against each other in this ratio, right? That these two here are give and take. If one gets bigger, it's at the expense of the other one. So we could, we could kind of refer to that in terms of their strength. A strong acid means that you don't have a lot of HA, you have mostly everything in the numerator, just about 100% in the numerator. And a weak one is going to be somewhere in the middle, and that all depends on, on the strength of it, which we will see coming up. Okay? So that's what this slide is trying to explain. You have to understand what I just said there will make a lot of stuff a lot easier. <clears throat> Common strong acids that we see in this class, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. You can add perchloric acid in there, but other than that movie Cloverfield Lane or whatever, when do we ever hear of that? Um, something that's important for us to see here, too, and we'll talk about this with what are called polyatomic or polyprotic acids, is sulfuric acid actually has two hydrogens that can be ionized. So does that make sulfuric acid stronger than the other three? No, because it's only one of the hydrogens that is 100% ionizable. The second one is now coming off of the ion that's left over, HSO4, with a negative one charge, and not very many of those pop off. 
you would say, well, still wouldn't a strong acid that also has part of it, a weak acid be stronger than a single diprot or, or monoprotic acid that only has one hydrogen? The answer is no. It, you know, it'd be like, uh, who's richer, somebody who has a million dollars or somebody who has a million and one dollars? Well, OK, technically the million and one. But is that one dollar really doesn't matter in the grand scheme compared to the first million? So strong acids ionize one hydrogen. Uh, the second hydrogen is not that ionizable, making that section not that important for the grand scheme of chapter 14. Just makes it important for some of the, the fluff that goes on at the end of it. Um, most acids are oxy acids, meaning that we have the polyatomic ion with, you know, an ox, uh, oxy anion there, something with oxygen. Um, organic ones car called carboxyl acids are going to have the carbon backbone like the acetic acid has. That's the common one that we see. We might see a couple others uh, later on. And then base dissociation constants to go with this, and then we'll make a comparison to the acid dissociation constant and see if we can start coming up with some with a theme okay all right so bronsted lorry theory says if something accepts a hydrogen ion it's considered a base ammonia becomes ammonium which means it accepted a hydrogen ion where did it get it well it forced it off the water molecule right so we could almost say something like to the effect of here's your ammonia and here comes a water molecule do -do -do. And by chance, this water molecule actually loses one of its hydrogen ears to the ammonia, forming the ammonium, and then goes away as a hydroxide ion. How much does that happen? Happens enough that this has a, a basic pH, right? But this would be the conjugate acid. This would be the conjugate base. Okay. And then, of course, water got forced to be an acid in this case. In a moment, we're going to call that amphoteric. If you write the uh, base dissociation constant for this, Kb is equal to the ammonium times the hydroxide divided by the ammonia. All right. Now let's do the acid dissociation constant. Technically, that's going the opposite direction. So what I could do is just flip this thing completely over. And I think on the slides online, or maybe even coming up next, I might even have that. Nope, I even just skipped that slide when I was making these a few minutes ago because that's not as important. But I will say it in words, that the Ka for the reverse reaction could just be take this thing and flip it over. Okay, So you know what? Let's write it in there. I'm just going to put it in pink. And then in blue, I'm going to put what I think is a little bit more important. So NH3 and then the... NH4 plus and the hydroxide, all right? So we could say that is the Ka. But how about if instead, let's talk about the reverse reaction as we did on a previous slide. We know what the reverse reaction is. I can't get the color to change there. There we go. Ammonium is going to be in equilibrium with ammonia and releasing that hydrogen ion. I don't know why I put it in brackets because I'm already thinking ahead and not thinking clearly. I'm getting there though. H plus and NH3. Okay. So now if we write the Ka for that instead, that Ka looks like this. And a couple things that we can say that are important is that what you're seeing here and what you see in pink are exactly the same thing. Right? These are exactly the same thing. They have to be. They just look different because of the way that we've written the equation, but they're basically doing the same thing to water. And why I wanted to point that out is let's say that we multiply these together. This is actually the point of maybe even as far as it could be tomorrow's notes. That if you say Ka times Kb, that what you're really saying is the H plus times the NH3. Worst part about all this is writing it all down. But you don't have to do it that many times. So it's not that big a deal. You see that in multiplying here, remember this is all multiplication and division. Just because I have two separate fractions, still all multiplication and division, which means anything in the numerator 
that is found in the denominator cancels out. And I don't know why I put a plus sign there. Let's change that to a, a time sign. There's reason why I put a plus sign there, but it's not anything we need to talk about for a long time. Keep that as a times. When we multiply those two together, look at what it did. Is it reduced this down to just H plus times OH negative? There must be something special about that, but let's not talk about it yet. Let's save it for another day. This is just a good thing for us to get started on a difficult concept. So we can see that. Right now, what's important from this slide is for us to recognize that the Ka and the Kb are somewhat of reciprocals to each other. It's just that not like regular reciprocals, you know, what's the reciprocal of the number two? It's reciprocal is one over two. These reciprocals was dealing with multiplication and division purely and it equaled one. These reciprocals don't equal one. They equal H plus times OH negative, whatever that is. We haven't discussed that yet, but they still kind of act like reciprocals of each other, okay? All right, let's keep moving. The self-ionization, uh, in fact, it is even coming up already today. So that was a good thing for us to already begin with because it looks like I'm already talking about it here. I, for some reason, I thought this was in tomorrow's notes. The self-ionization process of water. You have two water molecules. They're bouncing around, colliding with each other. And every once in a while, one of them breaks off the ear off of another one and takes that ear on as a chin and forms a hydronium, an acid, and then leaves the other one with missing an ear, a hydroxide. So if we write the K for this, we would say that the K for this is equal to the hydronium ion times a hydroxide ion divided by the reactants, only there'd be no reason to write the reactants in because they're liquid water and they don't have a concentration. Only aqueous solutions and gases get to go into K expressions. So in this case here, these are all that go in there. So we need to have a special name for this, the self-ionization process for water and call this KW. Now in your notes, this slide here is right below what was just written down above, which means that we actually can make another connection. Let's make the connection through this though. Since we know that hydronium is really the same thing as just hydrogen ion times hydroxide as a time sign. Hydroxide, we know now that Kw is actually equal to something else then. It's equal to the Ka times the Kb. Now we have the reciprocals multiplying together to actually equal something. So the question is, what is Kw? Because it's not one, right? True reciprocals, if you have the number 12, its reciprocal is one over 12, such that when you multiply them, they equal one. That's reciprocation that goes on with multiplication and division, right? So we almost would call them inverses of each other. These two, when they were inverses of each other in terms of the fractions that we had there, they don't equal one, they equal Kw. So what is Kw? What's its value? Experiments show that the self-ionization of water produces molarities of the ions, hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, of 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. So that if it's true that Kw is equal to hydrogen times hydroxide, we can say 1 times 10 to the negative 7th times 1 times 10 to the negative 7th and end up with that, and let's not put it over here, let's put it right below it so that we know it as a constant, one times 10 to the negative 14th. That's the KW for water. I'm still teaching you way ahead, but I'm gonna do it, it's worth it. And if this is true, that this is equal to KA times KB, if you know a KA and you know that it times KB equals one times 10 to the negative 14th, technically you know the KB also. So all you got to do is just divide to the other side, right? If we know one of these, we then inherently really know the other one because they have to multiply together to equal that. That's going to be important for us. No matter what an aqueous solution contains, in other words, no matter what a solution of water contains, hydrochloric acid, uh, ammonia, uh, you pick it, whatever you put in there, sodium chloride, whatever an aqueous solution, solution contains, what we always know about Kw is it has to equal 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So if you've got two things being multiplied here and you know that hydrochloric acid 
puts 100% of these in solution, then to make up for it, we know that there's got to be virtually 0% of hydroxide to make up for that. The two things are always adjusting with each other together. Sometimes we call that adjustment like the gas, the gas pedal and the clutch pedal on a car. You're always pushing one or the other. Of course, nobody drives an automatic car or a stick shift car anymore. But that idea that one gets bigger, the other at the expense of the other one. Calculate the uh, hydrogen ion concentration and hydroxide ion concentration for each of the following. So if it's true that 1 times 10 to the negative 14 equals H plus times OH negative, then as your hydroxide ion concentration gets bigger, remember 1 times 10 to the negative 5th is not smaller than 10 to the negative 7th, it's 100 times bigger then that means that the hydrogen concentration has to get 100 times smaller. So that simply could be the answer. You don't really even really need to do the math if you don't need to. I mean, you're doing the math in your head, right? For multiplying H plus times 1 times 10 to the negative fifth equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. Some of you might know your exponent math and know that that means that the H plus is 1 times 10 to the negative ninth because negative 9 plus negative 5 equals negative 14. Otherwise, you can just divide, use your calculator. You'll have to in questions like number letter B. Okay, in letter B, a slightly acidic solution, 0.9 instead of 1.0, just slightly acidic. Um, Now I'm going to need the calculator. I know my answer is going to come out to be uh, something times 10 to the negative sixth, like 9 times 10 to the negative sixth, because I need this to be where they add together to equal negative 14. Negative 6 plus negative 7 adds up to negative 13. But the 9, sorry, I got my eye itches, the 9 times the point 0.9 is going to be what takes care of giving us that extra 1 to get to times 10 to the negative 14. 1.1 times, I said 1.1, I said times 10 to the negative 6. I think I really meant to say 1.1 times 10 to the negative 7, which is close, right? And just trying to do math in my head and didn't get it right. But let's write it right. Because of course, if I was doing this on a test, I would use a calculator. I'm not going to take a chance and make a mistake with my math on something when I try to think it out. I'm not that smart to think it out, but I will when I'm doing my homework because we do homework frivolously because if we make a mistake, it's not that big a deal. Very acidic solution, 10 molar uh, acidic, uh, strong acid that's 10 molar that puts all of its ions into solution. We know that it's going to uh, have barely any hydroxide in there. 10 times the hydroxide equals one times 10 to the negative 14. Now divide to the other side. I guess I will just use the other slide. 10 to the negative 15th. Okay. Good times. Keep going. Last example. At 60 degrees Celsius, the Kw for water is no longer 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. In other words, it's a constant that is specific to our... Uh, probably 25 degrees Celsius. It might have said that on, on one of those slides there. If not, it'll say it at some point in time. Um, use Le Chatelier's principle to predict if that means that the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Okay, so if it's true that Kw, which could we call this the Qw? I don't really know where I'm going with this right now. I'm just kind of writing some stuff down. That's what we know that the formula looks like for the expression. Now, technically, that's over the uh, reactants, but we can't put the reactants because they're not concentrations. So I might put them over one. But I know that that top and bottom have to adjust in order for me to have this normally equal 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. So what is 1 times 10 to the negative 13th? This is 10 times bigger 
So when the temperature went up, when temp increased, what happened is the Q increased. So adding heat caused the reaction to favor making the numerator bigger, right? Adding heat, like Le Chatelier's principle, is causing the reaction to shift to the opposite side. When we put plus heat, we are now raising the temperature of our water up to 60 instead of being at 25. We've added heat, cause it to shift to the other side. So that tells us, therefore, by the way, I've talked that out, that this must be, um, so when temperature increased, um, uh, how do you want to put it? Uh, reaction shifted to products. So because of that, we would say endothermic. Now, I probably said it a little bit better on the next slide. This means that more water ionized at the higher temperature. So adding heat shifted equilibrium to the product. If, it, if it's as if heat was a reactant, making this reaction endothermic. There you go. Chapter 14, homework number one is your assignment. Looks like this. Lots of good problems for you to do there. I'll see you next time.